Okay, so this talk um, is called On the Origin of Conspiracy Theories. It's based on a paper I've written. And it's meant to answer the question, why do people initially posit conspiracy theories? So in the last like 20 years or so, we've seen loads and loads of papers about, and we talked a lot about this this weekend, um, what conspiracy theory means, uh, what are the conspiracy theories, uh, whether belief in them is ever rational, like so who believes conspiracy theories, and all these sorts of things. There's like loads and loads of stuff about this. But there's been, I think, like very little said about how we could go from a situation in which there aren't any conspiracy theories to a situation in which there are some. So what sort of situation or condition would have to obtain in order for someone to feel like, hey, the thing to do here is to posit a conspiracy theory. Um, so this paper is sort of meant to explain this. And it's meant to explain what I think is like a pretty interesting subset of conspiracy theories, not all of them, that would be bananas. Um, it's just for some, and in particular, it's about contrarian conspiracy theories, which emerge in broadly open sort of democratic societies. So the thesis, like very briefly, is as follows. Um, in open democratic societies, sort of the citizens sort of presuppose that the relevant authorities or the epistemic authorities or the experts or whatever you want to say, and I'll get clearer on these terms as we go, um, they're engaged in like a good faith pursuit of the truth, right? Like they're trying to figure out what's going on. Right? The scientists are trying to answer sort of important questions. The journalists are investigating important issues, um, so on and so forth. Right, they're trying to get at the truth of the matter. Um, and this presupposition that we have, uh, that these people are engaged in the good faith of the truth, um, generates certain normative of expectations on how experts ought to behave. Um, in particular, they ought to do things like be open to new evidence, be willing to engage with contrary views, um, sort of engage in the kind of scientific methodology that we all learn in grade school, right? You know, you you have a, you see a thing and he's explaining, you form a hypothesis, you go check, you get new evidence, you adjust your hypothesis or come up with a new one, right? Like you do this sort of like very like simplistic process. I think this is what most folks expect the experts to be doing. Um, and now sometimes, right, the experts do this. Um, somebody says, well, hey, that doesn't quite work. What about this? And they go, ah, shit, well, must be this other thing. But sometimes they don't. Uh, sometimes instead, uh, when they're presented with putatively relevant anomalies or they're presented with alternative hypotheses, they're instead like super dogmatic and really hostile and dismissive and resort to ad hominem attacks and just treat their interlocutors like dum-dums. And that's weird. Right? We wouldn't expect that. If the people who we take to be engaged in this good faith of the truth are so engaged, but we should expect them to go, well, I can't believe I missed that. I should think about that harder. We should expect them to go, you're an idiot, get out of here. But that's what we see sometimes. Um, and this generates a certain kind of tension. A tension between how we expect people to behave and how they do in fact behave. And as we go on, uh, you'll see that sort of the best way, sometimes the best way of resolving this intention, uh, the, this tension is by positing a conspiracy theory. So, before we get too far into it, we should get clear on some definitions. Uh, you know, we've talked a lot about definitions so far. Let's do it some more, shall we? Um, so by conspiracy theory, I just mean what M means, right? Sort of a very uh, minimal, neutral kind of thing. It's an explanation what involves a conspiracy. Um, uh, by expert or epistemic authority, I just mean something like, look, those people with a level of expertise on the relevant subjects sufficient to make a determination about the cause of the event in question. So think like scientists, prominent journalists, academics, government officials, these sorts of people. Um, now, by a standard or official account, I just mean the view endorsed by the relevant officials in their capacity as, in their capacity as officials or the view held by most or awaited most of the relevant mm -hmm. members. Um, and of course, by contrarian conspiracy theory, I just mean a conspiracy theory about an event or a phenomenon, which is inconsistent with the official standard account. So pretty sort of bog standard definitions. We should all be fairly familiar with what I mean. 
Um, okay, so let's talk a bit then about how this theory goes. So to get us going, I want to like just go through like a motivating example. So, and this is an example in which a birthday party will count as a conspiracy. So cheers to M and apologies are over here. Uh, so, so suppose that Smith and Jones um, are a couple and Smith's birthday is fast approaching. So Jones decides to throw a surprise birthday. He begins like the usual surprise birthday tasks of wrangling the guests. And as a result of doing this, like starts getting a bunch more phone calls and texts than is typical. And suppose that Smith notices this. She says, hey man, let's go on all these phone calls. And he responds by saying, phone calls, what? Texts, where? <laughs> um, and so sort of acts as really like sort of like, what the world are you talking about? I always get this many phone calls. Um, so he dismisses her concerns in sort of like a really flippant way. And the Smith like knows that there's been an uptick in phone traffic. She's not crazy. Um, and she knows that it's unlike Jones to be so dismissive. Right? He's not the kind of person that would gasp at her. Um, and she begins to wonder whether there's something going on. Whether Jones is up to something, probably something not good, that he's having an affair. Right? This is like a very standard plot device in, uh, in films and TV shows. There's like a great Tales from the Crypt episode about this. Uh, that one ends in murder. This one is not. <laughs> uh, so what's going on here, right? Well, first there's what I'll call uh, a factual tension, right? There's a tension between like how things tend to be and how things are, right? The tension in the facts of the matter. Um, so here, the uptick in phone traffic is out of the ordinary. It's a bit of anomalous data or errant data, as Ned Bryan would probably call it. Um, and next is what I'll call the behavioral tension, right? This is a bit of friction between how we expect someone to act and how they in fact act. The response from Jones, or this ad hominem gaslighting business, is out of character for Jones by Smith's lights. Um, and then we finally have Smith resolving the behavioral tension by supposing that Jones is up to something, probably something that we um, So we can run the same sort of thing here if I stop and ask for directions, say like, I don't, I'm not from Amsterdam, right? So suppose I'm like walking and I ask someone, hey, how do I get to this place? And he tells me, well, it's the easiest thing in the world, just go down this dark alley. Uh, I'm probably gonna think, well, maybe not go down the dark alley. And I might say, are you sure? It looks like a dark alley. And he might say, well, look, I'm the best direction giver that's ever been. And how dare you suppose that I would ever give you bad directions because I'm the truthiest truther that ever was. Well, then I might think that the fellow doubt protests too much. There's a tension here, right? That's not how people who are being honest behave when their honesty is planned. They usually go, no, no, like it seems weird, but that's the way to go, right? So the fact that my erstwhile guide has acted strangely, um, is going to sort of generate this this tension, and I'm going to resolve that by thinking that my would be guy has is trying to lead me astray. Um, so that's sort of some motivating examples, I think. So how does this map on to conspiracy theories? Well, um, I think they start something with very much like from Brian's '99 paper, where like you have this thing that happens, some event occurs, or some phenomenon occurs. And something, uh, some hypothesis becomes like the official account of the thing. But there are some things for which H seems unable to account, right? There's some anomalous data, there's some errant data, maybe there's some contradictory data. And this generates like a factual tension, right? Like, well, look, here's your theory. It's meant to explain all these things, but here's some things it doesn't explain. And here I'd have thought that your theory should explain that. Um, so you might just mention like, hey, what about these things? Or you might say, well, I have an alternative hypothesis. So as it explains all the things your thing can explain together with the things I reckon your hypothesis ought to explain. And now notice that like, there's no conspiracy yet, right? There, or there need not be a conspiracy yet. This is just like pretty standard stuff. This is the stuff that we do in class. This is the stuff that we've been doing all weekend. Who says like, well, I think that P, you go, ah, oh, well, P, can't account for these other things. So what about P star? Right? This is like this is a normal thing that we all do. But suppose now that someone raises these kinds of questions, um, or more likely, we watch a YouTube video or a podcast, 
in which someone that we sort of identify with or someone that we like raises these kinds of questions to a relevant authority. And that person responds by, uh, you know, being a jackass. They belittle that person, they make fun of that, that person. Um, you know, they do all sorts of things that we wouldn't expect someone like that to do, right? Rather than being like a Carl Sagan, they instead act like a Neil deGrasse Tyson. Um, and I think what we have here is a behavioral, a behavioral tension, right? We see, well, look, this person's supposed to be an expert, and experts are engaged in a good faith pursuit of the truth. This person's not acting like that, so what's going on? I think this is sort of like the first step to generating some conspiracy theories, is our attempts to resolve these behavioral tensions. So there's a number of ways we can do this. Not all of them result uh, in a conspiracy theory, but all of them do result in our taking the epistemic authorities less serious qua epistemic authority, which is bad in itself. And some of them involve positive conspiracy theories. So how might we resolve these tensions? So suppose we're in a situation uh, to make it concrete, like let's imagine that I think the moon landing is fake. And I have an alternative hypothesis about the moon. Um, or I just wonder like, hey, you know, you say you went to the moon, but what about the Van Allen radiation bell? Like they're concerned about that now, but they weren't concerned about it in 1969. How's that go? Like, why is it a big deal now? It wasn't a big deal then. Right, so suppose I ask something like that. And rather than say like, ah, oh, well, you know, here's why. You go, well, that's dumb, you're stupid, whatever, conspiracy theorist, ah, like we see so often. Now, like, how am I going to resolve this tension? Well, one way I might resolve it, uh, or you might think I might resolve it, is by saying, like, ah, yes, I forgot, I'm an idiot. But I don't think we do that, actually. I don't think that's, like, a lie option. Um, I don't think we, like, take ourselves to be asking what we think is a good question, and then, like, immediately go, like, ah, yes, I forgot, I'm stupid. Damn. Fizzled again. So I think that's kind of out. We can't resolve the tension that way. Um, I think similarly, we can't resolve the tension by supposing that the expert is stupid, right? If I thought the expert was stupid, I wouldn't have asked him in the first place, right? So I think we can't resolve the tension that way. But maybe we can resolve the tension by supposing that the expert is just ignorant. They're talking, uh, and their ignorance might sort of manifest in a couple of ways, right? Um, so in the first case, maybe, the expert is like an epistemic trespasser in the Valentine's sense. So someone who is an expert at one thing, maybe not an expert at the same thing, but they're talking over here as though they're an expert. So think like when Noam Chomsky talks about things that aren't linguistics, or when Sam Harris talks about anything. Um, <laughs> right, like, these are people who like represent themselves as being experts, um, but anyone who is a legitimate expert or who like has like some kind of know-how could be like, well, I don't know, that's a little quick, not so fast. So maybe they're talking out of school. Now, I don't think this, this, this resolves the tension with no conspiracy, but it results in our downgrading the epistemic status of that expert. And I think it in fact like sort of trickles onto how we think about experts more generally. Um, we take them less seriously qua expert. Second thing, second way the experts might be in here, maybe they're a show. Right? Maybe this isn't a real doctor. He just plays one on the telly, right? Um, he showed up on MSNBC or Fox News or whatever to tell you the sort of preordained talking points that someone gave him or her. And, well, that's all he can really say, right? He's, uh, to, to quote my favorite band, Cake, like, he's only biding time and reciting memorized lines. And so when you ask such a person, Hey, what about these anomalies? Uh, well, they're just not in a position to say what, and maybe why the anomalies are only apparent or why your alternative theory is no good. All they can say is, well, you know, that's stupid. <laughs> and, um, and so I think now, like, sort of, we're firmly in conspiracy land because we're like, well, this person's a shill. If they're a shill, well, they're a shill because someone wanted them to go on TV and say certain things for certain reasons. You might wonder why you're doing that. So we resolve the behavioral tension, right? The expert is acting the way we didn't expect, and they're doing that because they don't know what they're talking about, and they don't know what they're talking about because they've been placed there by some person or group of people to advance some agenda. Seriously. So that's one way we might resolve this tension. 
Another way is we might just assume that the expert is biased or arrogant or captured. Um, you might think, well, how can we, this goes a couple of ways. One way this goes is we might say, well, look, the expert here, they care about the truth, but they're just, they're just, they're engaged in a bad faith kind of way, right? So I think a nice example of this is uh, Louis Alvarez, like the Dinosaur Wars business from the 80s and 90s. So if you don't know, um, in the 80s, Louis Alvarez and his son, like sort of discovered like iridium deposits off of Yucatan, and they were like, aha, here's evidence of the asteroid impact that killed the dinosaurs and so on and so on. But like, and that's become like the dominant view um, in, I guess, geology would be. Um, but there are like other people who have different views, like famously Gertie Keller at Princeton uh, thinks that something else killed the dinosaurs. It was a slow die off, not an immediate die off. And she reckons she has a lot of good evidence for this. Um, and whenever she mentions this at a conference, or someone sympathetic to Keller mentions this at a conference, Alvarez or like Alvarez acolytes don't go, well, look, that's not good evidence for these reasons. They just go like, that lady's a nut job. Um, there was a great piece on this in the, uh, in the Atlantic about her, where like she's been called like all sorts of names and said that she's like the most dangerous person in the field or all this business, just for like advancing another hypothesis. So you might think like Alvarez, uh, like cares about the truth. Like he's really invested in his theory and he cares about the truth. He's just like, you know, he's just an intellectual bully. He's like a, he's a tyrant and like brooks no disagreement with his views. Um, and again, I think we can resolve the tension in this way, right? Like he's behaving in this way because while he cares about the truth, he's just like a bad actor. Even if he wants to get the answers, he doesn't want to get them in a, in a sort of cooperative way that we expect uh, experts to work. Um, and I think, again, that resolves the tension, but it results in our taking experts less seriously, uh, especially experts like this, right? Um, because you might think that, look, being sort of really strident and really lousy to people, that's gonna make it like, that's gonna make it harder rather than easier to arrive at the right answers. Um, so again, we resolve the tension, but we do so in a way that makes us take experts less seriously. Um, now, finally, it might just be that the expert is engaged in like some other pursuit, right? So we have this tension that we resolve by saying, well, I'll tell you what's gone on. They're just up to something other than a good faith pursuit of the truth. They're not concerned with getting the right answers. But if they're not concerned with that, what are they concerned with? Well, who the hell knows? Or it could be anything. Um, and here, I, again, I think we're like firmly in the realm of, uh, of conspiracy. Right? You might think, ah, oh, well, look, they're, they're up to something else. They have some agenda, I don't know what it is. What are the norms governing that pursuit? Well, who knows, but it's certainly not interested in getting the right answers. Um, maybe they're trying to cover something up. Maybe they really know what's happening and they just won't tell us, you know? And again, I think we're in sort of conspiracy territory here. I think maybe uh, a helpful analogy here is like, so think about like Grice and conversational implicatures. Um, you know, we can get conversational implicatures because there's a cooperative principle in conversation. So like if you, if I ask Julia, like what's the weather like? Julia says it's raining. Um, right? I can take Julia seriously because I think she's being truthful and helpful and so on and so forth. And so I might pick up an umbrella, right? We're engaged in a cooperative exchange. But if we're in an antagonistic con context, right? Well, in which the cooperative principle doesn't apply. And I ask Julia what the weather's like and I know that she's going to lie to me or I, she might lie. And she said it's raining. Well, it'd be really foolish of me to pick up an umbrella because I don't know whether it's raining based on what she said. Uh, similarly here, right? If you think that there are norms because they're engaged in this sort of good faith to the truth uh, project, well, then you're going to take what they say seriously and them acting in a weird way is going to be evidence of something. But if you think they're engaged in some other project, the norms for which you don't know, well, it's just not clear what they're engaged in. And so you might resolve that by positing a conspiracy theory. So here is, I think, a helpful picture of what I've talked about so far. So I think we present an expert with anomalies or alternative hypotheses. Um, the expert violates a norm uh, by acting in some kind of way we wouldn't expect, given that they're engaged in the pursuit we think they're engaged in. And we attempt to explain this in a number of ways and we kind of rule out that we are stupid or ignorant or that the expert is stupid. 
And we explain it in these other kinds of ways, right? Experts say they're, they're trespassing, that results in a downgrading of their epistemic standing. They're a shill, possibly there's a conspiracy. If they're captured or biased or whatever, maybe they're just sort of doing this in bad faith, in which case we downgrade their epistemic standing, or maybe they're involved in some other pursuit, in which case we might plausibly posit a conspiracy. So that's sort of the picture. Um, what's an example of this? Well, think like, like think about Roswell. Right? So something crash landed on that guy's farm in 1947. And initially, uh, the people who were like first responders said that they recovered like some strange debris. The Air Force said that they found a craft. Um, later, the Air Force was like, no, no, we did not, as it turns out, uh, find a craft. Um, and then they sort of like went back and forth and sort of eventually settled on, well, it was a weather. That's what it was. And people said like, well, look, I've seen weather balloons. That doesn't look like a weather balloon at all. I was there and that was not weather balloon debris. And what do the epistemic authorities in this case do or the officials in this case do? They were like, well, look, these people are just obsessed with little green men. They think there's aliens running around, so on and so forth. But they, they belittled and mocked these people. And well, what happened? I think the people thought like, well, look, I know I'm not crazy. And you're not acting in the way that I'm expecting to act, given that like, we want to find out the answers here together. So like, what's going on? Maybe there's, maybe there were aliens. Maybe there, maybe something did happen. And as it turned out, like we now know that there was, like the official story was bonus, right? There was a high altitude balloon used for detecting uh, atomic events uh, in Russia. Like we now know that. Um, so there were no conspiracies before. And then the officials acting in such a way sort of generated a bunch of conspiracy theories, or so I claim. So what's the upshot of all this? Like, what does this mean for us? Well, look, we've, a lot of the literature interviews about how like, our declining trust in excess is a real problem. And it's like our pension to believe and traffic and conspiracy theory is a big problem too. But if what I've said is right, then at least in some instances, this is a problem of our own making. It's kind of our fault. Um, and I say our because we're experts of some kind, right? Um, we and our <laughs> colleagues, right, have sort of allowed this business to happen by not engaging with people in the way that we maybe should. And if that's right, then we're in a position to like really do something here about both declining trust in experts and sort of our pension for trafficking and conspiracy theories. Namely, we can behave in such a way that sort of doesn't generate these kinds of tensions, right? When someone says, well, hey, what about, uh, what about this 9-11 business? We can, rather than saying like, well, that's stupid, we can go, well, look, I understand what you're saying, and here's a bunch of reasons why that doesn't work. We can do what Kitcher did, right? Um, we can engage in like a serious kind of way that shows people, no, no, we're committed to a good faith pursuit of the truth. We want to know what the answers are, too. We want to get it right. Um, and the things you're saying just are off base, or I hadn't thought of that, or you look like anomalies, but they're not. Right? We can act more like Carl Sagan uh, and less like Nick Um Now you might say, well, look, that's not, we don't have to do that. We can't do that. That would be crazy. Some of these people are just trafficking at things that are, as M says, mad, bad, and dangerous. And we, you know, we should do something different, right? We should like shame these people or ostracize these people. You know, take one of the very many tactics that like my colleagues suggest that we take. Um, Lee McIntyre's son, James, is my friend, and he, he is like an advocate of this, like, shame them into silence uh, uh, plan. But like, that's not a great plan. It's not gonna work. Um, and it's not gonna work because all it's gonna do is demonstrate that like to more and more people, they're like, well, maybe we're not like up to finding out the right answers. We were up to just like defending our entire theory that spine sets come on bay. Uh, and that's not a good look. Um, I think like a, a, a one benefit of this, so like I wasn't gonna talk about this, but I have a minute or two left, I guess, so I will. Um, you know, we've talked a bit about conspiracy entrepreneurs this weekend and like what a problem people like David Icke and Alex Jones are. 
I think we want to be in a position to say, like, those are that guy. That guy's full of shit. But if our response to anybody who has a contrary view is that guy's full of shit, then when people really are, no one's gonna believe us, right? If everybody's a conspiracy theorist that we don't like, then we're gonna be in a we're gonna we put ourselves in a really bad position when there is a legitimate conspiracy theorist and we want to go, go listen to that guy, that guy sucks. Um, and so I think behaving in a better kind of way will not only make us like look better at experts and minimize conspiracy theorizing because it'll make it because there won't be a good reason for people to posit conspiracy theories. It'll also like sort of give us the credibility that we need when we want to say, go listen to that guy. That guy's crazy. Um, and I think that would be good. So I'll leave it there for now. Uh, I look forward to your questions. Thanks for listening.